Hello, Virginia, and thank you very much for being a guest on About Freedom Show. Thank you. I'm glad to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Virginia. So I'm going to ask you right away about your NDE, if you want to tell the story to my viewers. This occurred in 1998 when I was 46 years old. And this is the one that everybody wants to hear because I've had several, but this is the one that really resonated the truth within me, what was going on. Uh, and it happened a week before of my NDE. I was, I had a farm and I, I just come out of the farm. It was like uh, in June and I was still a teacher. It was like the next week will be my teaching would be over for the summer. And I was watching the TV in my den by myself. And I was just sitting there in the TV. I didn't even know who what I was listening to. And this guy comes on and he looks like he's about 90 years old and he's got oxygen. And all he kept saying is don't get a heart transplant. And I thought, oh, this man is explaining that he's had a heart transplant and, you know, but he kept saying it into the TV toward me. And he kept saying, don't get a heart transplant. And I thought, okay, but nobody's in that room with me. But every time he would lean forward in the screen, it was almost like I could feel that he was saying it to me. And I kept looking around and thinking, is he talking to me? And then finally I realized he's talking to me. And so he kept saying it and I finally, I'm 46 years old. I was very healthy. I was athletic. I walked four miles a day. I was a teacher. I was a farmer. And so uh, I remember raising my hand and said, well, I'm not going to have a heart transplant. I'm 46 years old. You know, and I said it with such you know, strength in myself. And then the next week I'm looking at it. And I, uh, they wanted me, I had a massive, massive heart attack in June 2nd, 1998. And I was shocked. I mean, I thought it was acid reflux because three weeks prior to that, I had had an acid reflux or I was felt, I felt different. I didn't, it didn't feel like the heart attack necessarily. It just felt bad. And so I was teaching English and I remember I, and I was a Catholic educator, so I had sixth graders. And in fact, I had my younger son in that class with me. And I kept feeling strange because I was diagramming sentences for English. And I, and back then I could say, okay, guys, I'm going to be going down to see uh, my secretary, our secretary, which would be called Mary. And I said, everybody stay in the seat. I had made the alignment, you know, on the board, what they needed to do while I was gone. And I remember I walked down to my secret, the secretary and I said, uh, Mary, I really don't feel good. Now she wasn't watching me and I'm kind of a joker in teaching. And when I was teaching, I mean, I would joke around and she just said, okay, what's going on? And I said, I think I'm having something going on. And she said, what do you think's going on? And then she looked at me, she raised up. I must've been just, I didn't see a mirror or anything, but I must've been bleached out white. And she said, we're calling the emergency room right now. We're just calling the ambulance. And so they did. And I just kept thinking, no, I, I didn't feel like a heart attack. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. But I do remember this because the ambulance came in, the two uh, guys came in to pick me up and my, the kindergartners were out in the parking lot. That's where we would play. And I said, oh, no, 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 don't take me out into that area. I don't want the children to see me in a, you know, in a, going into an ambulance. And I remember this guy said, uh, ma'am, we're in charge and you got to go out that way. And I thought, okay, I'll just back off, you know. And uh, I remember getting in and one of the women, the nurses in there, I went to school with her. And her name was, um, well, we called her a different name, but it doesn't really matter. And I remember she saw me and she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't know what it is. I said, I just don't feel good. So they went immediately. I went into the ER and they were, they gave me this uh, liquid and I kept saying, I just don't feel good. I, it, and it wasn't like pain. It just felt like indigestion more than anything. So they gave me this liquid and as soon as I took it, it was like, it just cooled everything in my entire body. And I went, oh, wow. They said, well, you have acid reflux. I said, oh, 
I said, what is that? And they said, well, it's well, too much acid in your stomach and they're explaining us. Oh, so they say, if you take these pills, you've probably been upset about something and you've caused your indigestion, all of this. And I said, okay, okay, I get it. Well, then three weeks later, that's when I saw the TV show. And then the next week I was in ER again. And that doctor, that nurse said, you're back. I remember he looked at me, he said, oh, you're back. And I said, oh, I think it's acid reflux again. I just, I don't know. And he said, as they gave me that little liquid again, and this time it went down, but it didn't, oh, this was so different. This was like anaconda snake on my check chest and an elephant at the same time. So I couldn't breathe very well. I was really having a hard time breathing. It was like everything was just pushed down. And so I said, well, and then when they gave me that medication, it came straight up and ejected out of my mouth onto the wall. And that's when everything, oh my gosh, that nurse and this other nurse and then my friend that's a nurse, they just started saying, this is a heart attack. We need to get things ready. I mean, and I was going, and I remember them saying heart attack and I left my body. And I remember leaving my body. I left my body and I was sitting on the in the ER in the room but I also could see myself on the table, but I could see myself over here. And I was saying inside, how does that work? I don't understand how that works. Is How can I be over here and I'm out over here? And then the next thing I know that came back in and I was down in my solar plexus. And I thought, you cannot be in your solar plexus. How can I see all these things going on? You know, and they were all just, it was just, it's like, everything went into slow-mo. I mean, everything was very slow. And when they would talk, it would be like, no. And I thought, are they talking about me? And so one of them finally said, this is serious. This is a massive heart attack. We've got to get her really straightened out. I, I kept, and I fell back into my body and there was a voice inside there, or it felt like there was somebody inside of me pulling me real tight in back into my spine. Now I'm a teacher and I have a science background and I'm trying to logically work through this thing. If you can't be in your body, I can't be in the back of my spine. So you've got all of this stuff going on. And then as well as you're going on with everything's going on real slow. So there wasn't, you just don't have an understanding of it because that's not logical but yet you're watching it, you're experiencing it. So I remember I finally, this being inside of me kept holding me real tight. And I mean, held me real tight, very loving, very loving and said, just be still, peace, be still, be still. And I kept thinking, am I frailing out there? And I'm, you know, making movements, what's going on? And um, then all of a sudden everything got real still. And I don't know where I went. I don't know where I was, but then I came back in and I kept thinking, am I dead? And what's going on? You know, you really didn't understand the process and family. They had me, I guess they cleared me for three hours. I didn't even know I'd been there for three hours. And they were, the ambulance came in to take me to another hospital because they were needing to do the surgery for my heart attack. And um, I remember they were lifting me up um, to get in the ambulance and I heard the ambulance driver or the, the two guys and I heard him say it as plain as day. He said, she's not going to make it. And I got so angry inside. I thought, why would he tell me I was going to die? So now while I was in that uh, ER, my nun or Marcia came in because Somebody told her that I was in the emergency room. So she came in to just, you know, pray with me, whatever she needed to, because my husband was gone to get, when they told him that I was having a heart attack, he went and got his, my sons. He wanted them to be with me as well. And so she just kept praying with me. And she said, I'm going to take you with me. I'm going to go with you because nobody was with me. And she said, I, can I drive, ride with her in the ambulance? They said, absolutely. And I remember thinking, is this real? I mean, I could feel it all, but I kept thinking, is this really real? Is this happening to me? Now you're really in your yourself. There is nothing else going on, but 
you think you are in another state of mind. And that is what it is. So I remember all of a sudden when we got into the ambulance, I heard him say that and I was laying there and all of a sudden the lights went off in the ER, you know, in the ambulance. And I thought, well, why'd they turn off the lights? They need to do all the vitals. They can't check me. They're not seeing me. But the next thing I know, I'm no longer in the ambulance. I'm riding beside the ambulance in my body, kind of like driving along with them. And I thought that's not possible. That is not possible. So I was already out. I was out and I was, I could look at the driver on the ambulance and I was riding right along with him. I said, you can't do this. This is not possible. You know, you're trying to logically figure it out. And so I remember thinking, this is crazy. Why are these people acting the way they are? They're acting like I'm dying. You know, you crazy stuff. So when I finally, I, we got into the, you know, the ambulance got into the other hospital. And when they pulled me out of the ambulance, the wheels went down on the ground and it jerked me back into my body. And I thought, now I'm back. I'm back. Where have I been? Where, you know, and they, they were kind of, you know, you're just confused. So I remember laying down and I could see all the lights on the hospital, you know, just I'm driving, you know, riding through it. And it reminded me of a series on television called the ER. And I thought, it's just like ER. So when I got in, I, the nurses were there and my friends, uh, cause I was, it was, it was June the 2nd, 1998. That was my first uh, summer break. That was my first day. So I was in my classroom as well. That's why I had to end up going to the hospital because it just didn't feel right. And I remember that I thought, what is going on? Well, the nurses were there first and they were talking to me and they were telling me, you know, just calm down. And I thought, what is going on? And they were very kind. They were just so nice. Now the cardiologist that came in, I didn't know him. I'd never met him before. So he's trying to talk to me and he said, you know, uh, miss, uh, this is how it is. And this is how it's going to be. Uh, are you okay? And I said, well, I'm confused. I said, at what's really going on? He said, well, you're having a major heart attack. And he, and I mean, he was very kind, but also when he was there, he leaned over and he had a pocket in his, uh, you know, the, the uniform he had on or what he had. And he had a pen, pencil in it or a pen and he dropped and I saw it drop down into the floor. And I thought, how could I see that? So the next thing I know, I left my body again and I was down on the floor of the uh, surgery room and I saw that he had a pair of shoes that I used to wear and they were called uh, Kohans. They were $350 a pair and I thought, he doesn't have any booties on or anything. If I, I bleed on that. Now these are crazy things. This is what I try to explain to people when you're having a near death experience. you you you're trying to figure it out on another level. And I kept thinking, well, I'm going to have to pay for that. If he puts blood, if I get blood on that. And I remember thinking, why am I even caring? So I should never have been able to see any of that. But then it all started coming in, you know, and we were, was wheeled into the surgery room. But I remember they were telling me you're having a major heart attack. I had a 99% aorta uh, blockage which they were really concerned because they didn't know if I was going to make it or not. And I kept thinking, is it this bad? But I remember they had a screen up and he was looking at it because they were going to do in the growing, you know, they were going to come up into the heart and they were going to take a, it's like a little saw. That's what you feel like. It's a vibration. You feel it because you're very awake. I mean, they've given you anesthesia, but it's where you're going to still be awake. And I thought, wow, that is, and that, but I, before anything happened, I said, I want to see it. I'm a teacher and I want to teach this. And the, the cardiologist said, you want us to show you what we're going to do to you? And I said, yes, I want to see it. Well, I saw the whole thing. I saw it when he went in, I saw, but I remember when he broke into the clot, it was like, <gasps> my breath came back in and I thought, well, I can go home now, <laughs> but that wasn't going to happen. And so I remember all of that kind of went real fast. And then the next thing I, I'm in, I'm in a room at the hospital and I thought, how, what has happened here? 
and the priest has come in and now they're giving me the rights of sickness. They did not give me this, uh, the rights of death. He gave me the light, but he wasn't our priest. He was Father Moore, and they thought Father Frank, which was our priest, our parish priest, was going to be coming. He didn't. And I had all of my uh, co-workers that had come into the hospital, you know, to see how I was doing and what's going on. They were all out there arguing in the hallway about why I wasn't Father Frank there. And I remember thinking, that is so insignificant right now. Those are small details. I'm dying. And they're upset about the priest, the right per perfect pe priest coming in. And so I thought, okay, but I'm still kind of confused. It's like, am I really here? Am I, I wish people would understand if, unless you have a sudden death experience, because I see people and after they have real quick death, their bodies, they're still standing around their own, uh, you know, an accident or a wreck. And because I can see dead people, I've always been able to see that. So I knew stuff was going on, but I knew it wasn't matching what I always thought it was. So, but I mean, I remember, so the priest gave his, you know, his rights and, and everybody kind of left. And I was just sitting there thinking, what has happened to me? So then they take me to another uh, room and this is the uh, ICU. And this was another woman in there with me, and she was older. Now, I didn't see her. I couldn't see her. I could feel her, but I couldn't see her because we had a curtain between us. And at that time, I was just laying there, and the next thing I know, I kept looking, and there was like a little, first, a dot of light in the corner of my hospital room. And I thought, oh, I wonder why I'm seeing just that little light. The next thing, that light kept getting bigger. Bigger, bigger, bigger and bigger. And I thought, what is that? And then I thought, oh, bad drugs. They've got, they've over drugged me. I'm now seeing things I shouldn't be seeing. And the next thing I know, this big light came up and it was, uh, the, the light was bigger than the hospital. I was on third floor because I heard them say I was on the third floor. But this person was way past the sixth floor. And I thought, who is that? And he leaned down. He said, this is Archangel Michael. It's time for you to wake up. And I went, oh, I'm dying. I'm dead. Oh, my. I mean, I thought this is it. I, I've gone somewhere else. And he's got me and he's telling me and he's really giving me the riot, you know, about you need to wake up. This is, I thought I thought they were supposed to be nice. That he's not being nice. He was very firm, very exact. And I kept thinking, I I don't know what to say. And I couldn't talk either. It was like I was thinking about it in my mind, but I was experiencing it on the outside of me. So I remember the next thing he came back down, but he was outside of the window of the hospital standing outside. I thought that's impossible. That bad drugs. That's what I kept saying. Bad drugs. They've they've drugged me. I can't figure out what's going on. And then the next thing I had a whole cor you know, course of angels coming in and they're real going around my you know, bed and they're talking to me, but I could not even understand. They were talking. It was like this. And I thought, what are they saying? I couldn't understand a word, but I knew there's no way they could be walking around that room like that when I knew I had a curtain over here but they would walk right around and they would be talking to me, but I couldn't understand a word they were saying. And then the next thing that light came back in, my whole room shot up with light. And I thought, okay, I'm dead. I'm, I'm gone. Whatever it is, I'm gone. But it kept working on me all night long. They would talk to me and I couldn't understand them. Then Archangel Michael would talk to me and I thought, why do they keep just telling me that I'm dead? Why don't they just tell me I'm dead? You know? <laughs> and it didn't make sense. So that night, about three o'clock that night, and this is going on right there in the room with her, but I heard a man that came in and he sounded just like the narrator of the uh, National Geographic or the Learning Channel, which I'm a teacher. 
that's what we all walk at. You know, we watch all the time. And I thought, oh my God, that's the narrator of the National Geographic. I said, that can't be possible. So I'm feeling what talking, hearing him talk to her, but I'm also having this experience over here. And I'm thinking, this is bad drugs. That shouldn't be happening. You know, he's not a National Geographic narrator. We are having all kinds of these experiences. And so it was just kind of, I finally just rested. I remember my body just rested. And well, she did die. And I, the nurse came in and I said, did she pass? And he, she said, yes. And I said, oh, because I could feel her, but I didn't see her. And then I said to the nurse, I said, weirdest thing. And she said, what? I said, her is that, I said, was that her son? He, she said, yes. And I said, he sounded just like the National Geographic narrator. She said, he was. He flew in from California and I went, oh my God, it all was real. Even though the illusion over here didn't match, I knew over there had, and I knew that's how, but that's how spirit works with you to make you realize there's two worlds going on. I knew one world, but I also knew the other world. So that is the, what I call the narrow road. I was living in both worlds at the same time, in and out. And so that was the big wake up. And then I, I remember that guy saying, you know, don't get a heart transplant, which I did not. And they told me when I came back, when my cardiologist came back the next night or the next day, he said, you have got a major heart problem. And he said, you need a heart transplant. He said, you've got, uh, you know, we got, we can do this. You're 46 years old. Your heart's not good, but you've got a good body. You can get, and I looked at him and I said, no. And I remember the cardiologist said, what did you say? I said, no. And he said, well, let me tell you, you have six months to live. If you don't do that heart transplant, you have six months to live. And I remember thinking, six months to live. Now, my sons were only, I think at that time, the boys were like 10 and seven, or, you know, they weren't very old. And I thought, oh my God, my children are not going, I'm not going to see my boys. I'm not going to see my farm. I'm not going to be alive anymore. Oh my God. You know, it just, it overwhelmed me to think that just yesterday I was like this, and now I'm like this. So, and I really got very adjusted to it very quickly. I thought, well, I've got six months to live, so I'm going to use it. And I started making phone calls in the hospitals and apologizing to people. I said, I told them what was going on. In fact, uh, there was three or four people that I called and I had been not nasty. I've been very nasty to them. I had said some nasty things. Uh, one girl got fired and I called them. And I told him, and I remember the woman that I had got fired, I apologized to her. I said, that was my fault. And she said, well, would you be real honest? She said, uh, I'm glad you did what you did because I'm in a better state of mind now that you pushed me out. And I thought, oh, like that. I thought maybe I didn't so badly. I wasn't as bad as I thought I was, but I was still on the phone calling all my family, letting them know that I only had six months to live. And the next thing I know, and, I, and also what I had to remember is I had the growing. So they had a, a sandbag on my leg. I couldn't get out of the bed. They said, if you need to go to the bathroom, you have to do a buzzy. So we'll come in and you'll have to be on a bed, you know, bed, uh, bed pan. And I thought, okay. And, but I was scared to death. I'm going to tell you through this whole process, I was terrified. And I thought, well, I'm dying. And I'd always had a problem with death anyway, because my father died in the, when I was 16 and I watched him die through all of this process at the age of 11 to 16. So I had a really bad feeling about death, that death was the worst thing in the world you could ever go through. You know, you're going to go to hell, it, it horrible stuff. But I remember thinking, okay, well, if I got six months and I know I'm going to heaven or I'm going to hell, one or the other, so I'm going to make sure I get clarity that I'm going to go where I need to go. And I remember asking all of these people and they just didn't understand what I was saying at all. I mean, I, I and I would cry and say, do you understand? They said, you're not dying. I said, yes, I am dying. And then I remember the nurses came in probably about two or three hours later and they said, we're going to pick you up 
and we're going to put you in a wheelchair and then we're going to take you up to another room and you're going to get on, uh, you're going to start working out and making sure, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You all told me I can't get out of the bed. I've got to do a bed pan and you're going to tell me you're going to put me on a treadmill and you're going to, I said, you're going to kill me. Are you all trying to kill me? I mean, and the nurses just would go, they kind of would giggle, but they didn't giggle. It was very odd. I thought, they're really going to kill me. And so they were working on it to put my oxygen on and everything. And they dropped it and they dropped it on the back of my neck. I said, they're killing me. They're going to take me up there and they're going to kill me. <laughs> the things you think about is the craziest stuff. So when we were wheeling down to the elevator, this other woman, and she was a nurse in there with us, and I didn't know her. I knew my two nurses that were with me, but I didn't know this woman. And she turned around and looked at me and she grabbed my, well, she touched my hand like this. She said, touch me, just touch me. And I thought, touch me? And I said, I'm dying. I've only got six months to live. Now, the two nurses, they were all sitting there and they were all kind of going, hmm. You know, you knew that there was a com communication going on, but I wasn't a part of the, you know, privilege to that. And I remember the woman said, I said, you want a, a dead woman touch you? She said, please do, please. And I thought, okay. I put my hand on her. I said, okay. Does that make you feel better like that? And, and I had, I was an actress. I studied to be an actress. So I got really into my acting mode. I thought, well, if I'm done, I might as well enjoy dying. And I mean, okay, if that's what you want. I mean, it was very dramatic and I start laughing about it every time I think about it. But the nurses were very, and they said, when you go back in there, you, and they kept doing their thumbs like this, you can do this. And I said, they're going to kill me. They're going to get me on that treadmill and I'm going to have a heart attack. And so we pulled into that room. There was my cardiologist and there was his Kohan shoes and he was setting up in a bed and he had a list or something. He had a pen in his hand and he was really just kind of irritated. You could see the irritation in his face. And I thought, why is he so upset? I'm going to die right here. <laughs> the crazy stuff. You know. So I remember the nurses kept saying, do it, just do it. And I'd only been there at that time, two days. So, and I walked four miles a day. So when I started first, I was very slow because I was afraid I was going to have a heart attack and die right there. So, but then when I started getting more energy and I thought, wow, I can do this. And then, then he said, turn it up even more. And I thought, turn it up. So then it really, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And, and I thought, oh my God, I, I'm not dying. I'm my heart is good. I'm just running and yeah, you know, and then he said, stop, everybody stop, take her back to the room. And I thought, I passed, I passed the test, whatever it was. And I remember when I came into the room, my husband was in there. My family doctor was in there. The manager of the hospital was there. Another cardiologist was in there. And then the cardiologist that I'd just been with. And they're discussing me while I'm in bed. And they're discussing about me. And they're saying, well, we really call this shocked heart. And I'm thinking, shocked heart? What are they talking about, shocked heart? I'm dying here. i got six months to live. What are they talking about? And then I remember they're, they're talking at me, and I thought, why are they not talking to me? Am I already dead? And then I did raise my voice because they were really having these long discussions about me. And I raised my head up and said, I don't care what you call it, shocked heart or whatever. I call it miraculous healing. And I laid back down. I remember because I was so afraid that I was going to have another heart attack because I was terrified. I'm not going to, I was terrified. And so I remember them just looking at me and he said, go on, told the nurses, go on. And then they all kind of left. And I just sat there and I thought, what's happened here? Am I dead? Am I not dead? Am I living? What, what is going on? And finally the nurses came in and said, you've had a real change. And I thought, and the thing I did notice about these nurses, cause I was 46, they were all about my age. So they were all looking at me from a whole different point of view because that could be them laying in that bed as much as me being in that bed. There was a lot of uh, camaraderie uh, with the uh, nurses because they were aged my age. So I remember they came in and they said, 
you can't imagine what's happening to you. And I thought, such as give it, you know, share. And they didn't tell me a whole lot. They said, are you ready to take a shower? I said, well, I can't take a shower. I thought I couldn't go anywhere. They said, we're going to let you go to a shower. Now we were still at the ICU. So I did, they didn't have a shower. They usually have a table that you could lay them on the shower, you know, to do shower like that. They let me walk over to that shower and they all sat in their little cut, you know, the corners of where they were. And they were going, you got it. You did a job. And I'm thinking they're really excited about me, about what's happened. I got my shower, got, went into the, you know, the hospital room and I sat there and I, that night I just kind of pondered everything. And my husband had come in and I thought, what has happened? There's something different. I just didn't know what it was. Well, the next day, the three nurses came in and they said, you're going to, you're going to be, take, you're going home. And I said, I'm going home. I, am I, am I going to be okay? Am I going to, what's going on? They said, this one nurse looked at me and said, all I've got to say is this, don't come back. I said, I'm not going to come back. Why would I want to come back? And they said, you've given us hope. And I thought, what? So when I'm willing, being wheeled out to go to the car where my husband has, you know, is going to meet me, the nurse, she looked at me and she said, you don't know what you've done for our hospital. You've given people hope that we can come out of death and they're going to live. And I thought, that's a miraculous healing. That's the way I saw it anyway. And so I remember when she lifted me up to get in out of the wheelchair, she put her arms around me and she said, you have given us you know, you have given us hope. And I got in the car and she said, good job. Like, <laughs> and I thought, and I remember Ron, my husband and I were talking. He said, this has been a long three days. I didn't, I didn't realize it was three days. And he said, but you're going home. And I thought, but I didn't talk when I came back home. I didn't, I was so confused about life and what, and I knew what had happened to me has been miraculous. And I had an experience the week before. I had already had these, to, uh, you know, before. I had had, you know, I was my mother's seventh miscarriage in 1951. So I had already had an experience as a baby, but also I had drowned twice. I've had two strokes, two heart attacks. And then in 2019, I had a paralyzed all the way from the neck down. And so I've come through every one of those. And then I just had a heart attack just a year ago and I walked out in less than 24 hours. Now, every doctor knows everything that I've ever done. And they know that what I'm talking about is I'm talking about me. And I don't even ever, they'll say things to me. I said, I don't believe that. I'm not going to do that. Because I'm also 72 years old and I've got power of my age and my uh, wisdom. So I remember all of these things had been happening to me for a long, long time as a child. Now it's accumulated into being aged of 46. Now, the only thing that I can tell you about NDEs, a lot of times this happens. I think my husband at the time, it was about three months and I was getting back to go to t uh, teach again. And he said to me, I don't know who you are. And I think you need to go back to the hospital and collect who you were and bring it back here because I don't know who you are. And I thought, what do you mean? He said, you don't act like my wife. When I did, I, I was very um, quiet. I, you know, even all my friends even told my husband at the time, said there's something not right. And a lot of people we quake because of the heart attack that I had not had enough oxygen in my brain. And I thought, no, it's not about that. It's about, I started pondering about life, about God, about, you know, and I was a Catholic. So I was, you know, I felt like I was safe. I knew that, you know, I'd done everything I could do. I was a good community person. You know, I was following all the rules. And that's another thing I remember when I was in the hospital, I said, I have followed the rules. You know, A, I went to the, you know, got college. I found the husband, got the house, have the 2.2, 2, you know, 2.2, I think it's 2.5 kids. I've got the house. I had everything. I had, you know, the wealth, whatever I felt it. But I remember saying this to me, I said, but it's empty. I said, I had all of the things surrounding me and the love of people around me, but it was empty inside. 
And it was an empty that I'd never experienced. It was an eternal emptiness. And that's when I decided I need to find out who that is in me. Why do I have all of these riches outside, but I'm not rich within? I'm not full and, you know, in peace. And that was when my journey began to really look at near death experiences. I started working within my body. I started doing electromagnetic field because I am a scientist. And so I started doing light and just trying to figure out how did I get in this state of mind? And that's when it all began. It started, that's when that, uh, that event in 1998 from my near death experience that I remembered that took me back to being a child. And I remember going down to see my mother's womb. I felt her now my mother and I did not jive. And what it is, is because I felt like she was holding me back. What she was doing, she was trying to save my life. But when I was down in her womb, there was a whole different experience with my mother than it had been when I was a child with her or as an adult. I realized my mother loved me so much. She was trying to hold me in her womb so I would not be released too soon. And I... To this day, my, now my doctor that delivered me still, and now he's dead now, but he said, I would not have ever believed you would have died. You know, you would have sl you know, lived. He, they didn't expect it at all. Not in 1951. That was I was only a pound and seven ounces back then. And they had not done any of the technology of kids. And so I thought, wow, this, is this a, a miraculous healing? What is this? Well, the cardiologist that I had worked with at the hospital, he was treating me still as though I had a heart attack issue. And he was making me do all these menus and all these pills. I had nine different pills. And one, I guess three weeks after the heart attack, I just, I tried to take them and I couldn't. I vomited them up. And this voice inside said, you know, you have been healed. You do not need this medication. And so I told my husband and he saw me take it. He saw me put all the pills on the trash. And I said, I'm not going to take anything else. I said, it's making me sick. Why did they tell you that you're, it's a miraculous healing? And he said, well, they didn't say it was a miraculous healing. He said, it was a shock tower. And I said, I don't care. It was what it was because I was dying and the next thing I'm living. And so I remember we had a friend that had a personal friend that was a cardiologist. He was an older one. And he got us in because he's very, he was famous in the, my area and he was hard to get into. So he just called him personally and said, I need her to go in there with you. And he was wonderful. I was sitting there with him and he came in and he said, this is the new doctor, the new cardiologist. He said, so what do you want to call this? I said, I want to call it a miraculous healing. And he said, we're going to call it anything you want. And I thought, because they were making me feel like, and he, I said, do I have to take all those pills? He said, you don't need anything. And he said, the only thing I want from you is every year on your birthday, if it's on a day you know, that you can come to here, I want you to come in and do a, stred, stred, um, a treadmill stress work with isotope and just check in your heart and make sure every year, that's all I want from you. I thought you've got to be kidding. And so every year after that, I went in and what he did for uh, his, uh, I guess it was his uh, interns that they were coming in there to talk to him. He would have them come in to meet me and he'd hand them all of my credential, you know, what I had, my medical uh, history. And he said, I want you to see something because it's really, really happening now. And he said, watch her. Now that they had looked at the history and they said, oh my gosh, she shouldn't even, she should be not with oxygen. She should be in such a state that she shouldn't be alive. And so I got up on the, you know, the a treadmill and I started doing my thing and they were all, and he, he took me off and he said, what do you all see here? And they said, we can't believe it, that she could even do the work she's doing from what she's done, you know, with the heart attack. And he turned around and this is when it was so powerful. He said, we can do a lot of things as card cardiologist. He said, but you can't be God. And that was God. 
And I thought, wow, yeah, miraculous healing. But that also took me on, like I said, the journey of my life because I did teach um, the next year I was teaching in 1999. And I remember on, I think it was in August, I was going to work and my kids, my boys went to the same school. And there was a voice that said, you need to quit your job today. And I pulled my car in and I did. I quit my job, but I did stay with them for that year because you couldn't leave them like that. But I said, I want to get two weeks off. I'm gonna do, and I started demanding because I'd been there for 13 years and I mean, it's stressful. I don't care what anybody says. Teaching is stressful. And so I said, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. And I did it. And then the next year I quit. I mean, uh, and they gave me a big ceremony and saying goodbye. And, all. and that's when my journey began. And I, I sat for almost five years. That's when Jesus came in for 18 months. And he t told me what was really going on in the art world. He, uh, I had Socrates that came in and I did teach about Socrates. He came in, but he came in very differently. He, I was, I was really going learning in to do meditation. I knew meditation was a big deal. And I was told meditation would be what I needed to, you know, de-stress everything out of my body and you can really change yourself. And I thought, I've got to change myself. I wasn't doing a good job. I wasn't a very nice person. Not, not that I was mean or, but there was these little messages in the back of your mind that, you know, when you'd say, oh yeah, yeah that's a beautiful dress. And underneath your mind or in the back of your mind, you're saying that is the worst looking thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, you're not telling the truth. You're lying a lot about things, people that you love that, you know, you're not telling the truth. You're not being honest with yourself and you're certainly not being honest with them. So that was my first beginnings was learning to love me first, not to give everything out, to learn. And I wasn't ever trained to love me. I was trained to love everybody else outside of me. There were so many divine messages in that five years that have Jesus coming in. And I remember one day he came in and he said, I, well, I thought if I want to ask if Jesus is going to come into my house, then I'm going to ask him a lot of questions. And I remember the questions. I said, how do people know you? He said, as they have met, as they have been taught what I look like. I said, oh. He said, you would never have known I was Jesus if you hadn't had an image of what I looked like, the way you thought. He said, everybody has an image of me and everybody will recognize that image. But he said, and I remember this. He stood in the room and he just turned into white light. He said, and all I am is light. And I went, oh, wow. And boom. And that's when everything really opened up for me. I started seeing things. I was doing uh, deeper meditations. And I was doing Oso uh, meditations. And he came to me. Oso came to me and said, you need to meditate. Do you need to work with me? And I thought, who is this man? You know, and it would be telepathically, but it would feel like that he was right next in front of me. And he, uh, next thing I know, I got a book from him, not him personally. A friend brought it to me and said, I feel like you need to read the, this and work with these meditations. I thought, how did they even know that I was even seeing? Because I wouldn't tell anybody what was going on in my house because my family thought I had lost my mind because also I could talk to the grass. I could talk to the birds. I could talk to everything around me. Everything was alive. Every color was different. And they were living in the world that uh, we call the world of man. And I was living in the world of God. And so there was not a lot of communications because they really thought I had lost my mind. In fact, my husband, and I heard him say this on his mind, that they were going to try to have me committed. And I turned around and said, Oh no, I'm not to be committed. And it scared him because I heard his mentalness. I didn't hear him say that in his you know, voice and it scared him. Then that's when everything, because I became very conscious of what people were thinking, how people were acting, because I've been doing some really deep work with me and it was giving me an insight and wisdom that I'd never experienced before in this world. 
So it was a different ride, totally. And it ended up that I ended up having to leave my family. And if I had not had that experience with, you know, God, and I was seeing God and Jesus and all of these other beings. I mean, I would do mirror work and people would come out of the mirror and I thought, I'm crazy. I'm crazy. You can't do that. You can't see that. But I was having these experiences. And I remember on um, there was a big conflict and my oldest son was getting ready to hit me come down like that and hit me and he couldn't. And then the voice said, you need to leave now. They're going to hurt you in the back door. Um, from my garage to my kitchen, the back door opened on its own and I walked out and God said, do not look back, just look forward. And I did. And I walked out and became a new world came, you know, I ended up getting a divorce. It was ugly cause I was under domestic violence. Uh, but, that all kind of got cleared up because my, my family was confused. And so was I, we, you know, I feel that's why I work with NDEs a lot because they're trying to figure it out. I understand exactly one day you're like this, the next day you're not like this. And then everybody doesn't, they see you like this, but you're not like this anymore. And it's very confusing for everybody. So that's how I got into near death. But also I got involved with the electromagnetic field because I did science and I did uh, light theory. I did uh, heat theory. I had all of this understanding. So I went down in my body because I was trained to go into a meditation, look at the clock. And you know what it said? It said, you lay in your body and don't get out. And I thought, why would I stay in my body and not get it? But what you do is, at the beginning, I think a lot of NDEs go out way out into the universe. I was out in the universe for the first year, probably more than any, and I would come in and out. And this is what a lot of people say, how can you do that? Because everybody can go in and out. They just don't think they can. If you're doing daydreaming, if you're even at a party and your mind is thinking about your babysitter or your children, you are not present in that place. Your body's there, but your mind is gone. This is what I try to teach people that there are out of body experiences going on all the time. We just haven't been trained to understand how it feels. So I, but I've been like this, I mean, as a little girl, I, I'm an animal communicator. That's one thing I started out a long time ago because I was an only child. I could communicate with animals. I've always been able to do that. I thought everybody could do it, but I thought everybody could hear everybody's mind, you know, that's why I was a very good teacher because I could see how they would process in their mind. But that was something I was trained to do because I was a psychiatric social worker, then a teacher. So I was very observant to about everything, you know, when people's fingers would twitch or you learn, but that was preparing me for the NDE to understand how it all worked because little jerks inside, if you're laying in your body and you've got pain inside of there, I go down into the pain. I, I work with the pain and all of a sudden the pain's gone because we got pain so deep inside of our beingness that we haven't even recognized that's even there. And that's what I teach people. That's why my company's called Soul Work. And that's why my company's called Revisions. And it's to review it again from a different state of mind. And that's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. From that near-death experience to understand that I've had a lot of other those. And now I am 72 years old and I'm teaching still. And it's, it's amazing. It's amazing work. It's where people can really, you don't have to have someone like me. You can, if you're willing to go inside and you're so when you have a relationship, things change com completely anyway. And that's all I'm trying to do is from the, all the podcasts and when working with you is I just want people to know that they have opportunities here to change their life simply by changing themselves within. That's all it is. Well, thank you very much, Virginia. That was amazing. And I think you answered all the questions that I was going to ask you. So I don't even know what to ask you, but I'll <laughs> ask you. <laughs> I was making notes here and you were answering to my questions that I was making notes to. I said, okay, let me ask about Jesus, and you're talking about Jesus. And yeah. then I was going to ask you about your purpose, and then you're talking about that. Let me ask you a question. Um, are you afraid of that? No, not at all. First of all, to me, and people need to find this within, 
there is no such thing as death. Death is only here for the physical. Your, your soul is eternal. It lives on it. That's what the Bible, that's what Jesus taught me. There's a Bible within the Bible and he taught me how to go. Well, and I have the Bible sitting there. He put it up in his hands and he said, there's a Bible within the Bible. He said, dive in and it turned into water and I just went in. Now you can't do that in you know the physicality of your physical body, but you can supernaturally. And God is supernatural. We cannot put God on a image because that's not who God is. That's not a man or a woman. When I crossed over, I did not see a man or a woman. I saw light and a, a very intelligent light and a loving light that never once talked to me about going to hell or anything. I put myself in hell. And I think what people don't understand, they put themselves in hell because they, they judge their own selves and they do bad things. So you, whatever you're perspective is, is how you're going to be see, received through going, you know, crossing over. I've had a lot of people who've said they've died and went to hell. And I said, so when they came back, I said, so what is, what made you go to hell? I said, God didn't do that. You did that. And a lot of people don't like to hear this because they're responsible. You're accountable for your actions and deeds, good or bad. However, your perspective feels it. Just like me, when I had to go into, when they told me I had six months to live, my perspective was totally different than the people that I were calling. They didn't even realize that I had even done anything that I felt they'd done, you know, that I'd done to them. So that's why I said, you've got to be accountable within self. It's an inside job. And that's the best job you could ever do is find out who you really are from when your soul is. And then have a relationship with that and then learn how to heal that way. Oh my gosh absolutely empowerment for the world. Okay, Virginia, one more question. What's your definition of freedom? Freedom is to be able to do whatever you choose to do when you choose it without any restraints, you know, not being held back. Like the world we live in, the world of man, and I call it the world of man, is very restrictive. It's very programmed. And this is how, and when you walk over that line, you're going to get judged or th and say, I don't care about judgment anymore. I don't care if people don't like me. I don't care because they don't even know who I am. The only reason why I say that is because they don't even know who they are. If they knew who they were, they wouldn't be judging of one finger pointing, three fingers pointing back at anybody because they knew that was their own personal perspective. And that all I think we are and what God does is gives us all mirrors. We're mirrors to each other. You can either have a mirror of greatness or a mirror of hate or anger or whatever it is, but that's an opportunity to reflect back to you to learn who you are, not to judge them. That's what the Bible says, judge thyself as that be judged. Pretty clear to me. It's so simple, but it's so, you know, it's complex at the same time, but the simplicity is what I live by. I live a very different world. I don't get upset about too much unless uh, somebody says, and I don't like somebody to lie to me. And the sad thing about this is I usually know when somebody's lying to me and I'll even, I'll address it very quickly. I said, you're not telling me the truth. And I have clients all over the world. And so I teach my clients to be honest with themselves, not in judgment and learn from that judgment and that to me is freedom. Now, if you would like to share the information about yourself, if people want to find more about you, where they can teach or reach you? Well, I have my website. I think I gave you my website and you please put that on your thing. They can connect to me from the website because uh, for the last four months, I have done nothing. I have a producer. This is a dear friend of mine. He's uh, like a son. I called him when we saw everything that we had over five to 6,000 emails in less than three months. I wasn't prepared for that. So I had to get a new system. We had to put in a new, I haven't had a website because I have a private business. You would never met me. None of you, I would have met me because I was very low in the, I was under the radar. I did not want to work with a lot of people because the work I do is intense. 
it is working and I wanted people who were really ready to do the inner work of the soul. I didn't want to work with now I, I, I'm a psychic. I don't do psychic work anymore. I do this work because I know it can change the world in each one of us. Not that we're changing the world, but we're changing ourselves. Therefore it changes everything around them. Therefore it changes everybody else around you. It's all frequency and vibration. That's all this is. And your body is your, you know, it's the vessel that holds your soul. And so I learned how to utilize my vessel to heal my soul. And if you, if you can heal your soul, you will heal your body. And I mean, you can see I'm 72. I've had a lot of out of body experiences. I've had several near death experiences and I'm still very much alive and very, oh, I think I look good to be 72 myself, but you know, there's a lot of people might think differently, but I look at myself and I think, gosh, Jenny, you're, you're really doing okay. Okay. Now as a psychic, do you have any major predictions for 2024? Well, I don't do psychic because what I do is I make people go inside themselves and see what their predictions are for themselves because we can put all of these things out. And I mean, we've seen it over and over. They'll give you, but what that does, majority of those, those thoughts and those you know predictions, they're fearful. I don't want to give anybody fear. I don't want anybody. I want them to find the greatness in them that, and to raise that frequency up to be the great lights that they are because we can change things. Everything in your mind, you can change your mind, you can change your world. But also remember, you have to remember there's only two emotions on this plane. That is fear or love. Now, how we deem that fear and love, that is just what, it, but if you will just simplify everything, is that fear? Is that love? Then you have a simple, you know, you're simplifying everything. Well, if I'm in fear, why in the world would I want to be in fear? And then you start asking questions. Why did I feel that? What was good? What was it that made me have that in my body? Why did I even think that? That's when you start getting really aware and into the wisdom of what you've been given. Thank you for watching About Freedom Show. I really appreciate you. Click on one of the videos below and don't forget to subscribe.